Um, <clears throat> right, we're uh, continuing on in a service, series of sermons on the book of 1 Peter. It's been an interesting study. I, I also um, have been um, meeting with a group of, um, how should I say, I guess they're career, they pretty much all have their jobs. One young lady has opened her own business and another one runs all over Asia. One other person runs all over Asia doing sales. But I but, uh, had some very good conversations about this very subject of uh, First Peter suffering for doing what's right. And this one young lady was telling me that uh, she's in a young startup company, started about two years ago. Uh, she started there about two years ago. There was only like five people. Now they have over 30 people. It's just a booming business, uh, internet business, of course. And um, she said that she's the only person in the office that's a believer, a Christian. So you know how, typically how it is at Chinese New Year or at certain times of the year. They're, they buy a bunch of food and set it up on table and they have, a, a, as a, in Chinese, a bye-bye and uh, a worship. And, and she's bookkeeper. So she's the one who's instructed to take some money and go out and buy the goods, prepare and everything. So she went to her boss and said, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't mind doing this because I, I can buy the food and so forth and setting it up, but please don't, don't ask me to participate. Uh, I'm a Christian, and I just, uh, I just don't feel right about it. And uh, uh, the boss's mother had a really hard time about that, but the boss was understandable and said, that's fine. So uh, it just helped me to realize that, that many of us don't face these difficulties. And we also live in Taiwan where it's, we're fairly, I'd say that we, there's a lot of freedom in this country. But my experience is the reason that we, so, we feel so free in this country is because we're not rubbing up rules and regulations that we don't like. If there was a lot of rules and regulations we don't like, then we would say it's not so free. Um, Law-abiding people don't have problems with freedom. It's people who don't abide by the law who feel like they're not free usually because they're in jail. So uh, it, this, this idea of freedom and submitting to the law, these are, these are things that we've been talking about, and they're things that in, for some people in countries are real important. And today's subject, we're going to talk about doing good and when, how doing good sometimes hurts. It's, it's difficult. Uh, so uh, I don't know if you have any testimony of having been criticized or mocked or even some even received physical harm because of your belief, because of your faith. Again, we, we live in, in different times where one of the basic foundations of our, of our civilized society is you're free to worship as you please and as you believe in, according to your belief in God. There's a lot of places where that's not true. But I also understand that within our society here, there's also uh, situations, places where you may not be free to worship God as you please. And in, in doing what's right, it's not always easy. So Peter here is writing out this, this letter to people who are living their faith in a pagan society. What is, I haven't mentioned anything about what is a pagan society or what a pagan culture is. It's one that follows a polytheistic religion. In other words, they worship many gods, gods, small g gods, that will help them to be able to uh, reach to the big G God. Because many people realize there's such a gap between us and the big G God, uh, almighty God, that th we can't get across. And so there are those beings who have, who have risen above us. They're little g gods. And in worshiping them, we try to curry their favor so that we might find favor with the most high God. This polytheistic uh, kind of religion is what we would refer to as, as paganism. Or a pagan society is one that has little or no religion and delights in the sensual pleasures and material goods. It's just, it's a very physical thing. It's how can we satisfy ourselves. Uh, the the uh, people to whom Peter is writing are living in that kind of situation. And so Peter is writing to encourage them, don't give up in your trials. Don't give up in your difficulties. And so we saw how he writes uh, to us about how we're to live in this. And we read this in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. He says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners, remember this, we're traveling through. We're, we're 
tourists, as it were. We're not going to put down roots. We might go and see the sites and so forth, but we can't put, we're, you know, we just keep on moving through. We're sojourners. We're exiles. And he says to abstain from the passions of the flesh, to, which wage war against our soul, to keep our conduct amongst the Gentiles honorable, so when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. These were the verses that we've been looking at because he tells us this. We deal with these passions in our flesh. We realize there's this, there's this desire to do what's right, but we don't always do what's right. We also understand we find ourselves enjoying doing what's wrong, but we know we're not supposed to be doing that. And so within us, there's this spiritual battle that rages. There is a victory to this battle, and Peter's going to get to this victory. But our greatest battle is not necessarily with the evils of this world. It's not necessarily with the one who's the devil. Our greatest battles have to do with the passions, the evil passions within our own breast, within our own heart, and how, how to, to deal with those in order that we might be able to counter the culture that we live in. And I began last week to talk about three areas about how we counter the culture we live in. One of those areas is being submissive. We talked last week about playing the role of Jesus. Playing the role of Jesus. By being submissive then to someone. And, and I, I mentioned the fact that, you know, I think this is pretty amazing. I, I'm not, I guess I should be a better historian with regard to religion and so forth, but I don't know how many gods have actually, especially almighty, all-powerful gods, have a story about how they left their power and their might and became subservient to their creation. Jesus Christ is God who is at creation. But Jesus Christ came to this earth. We just celebrated a birth at, at Christmas time. He came to this as, as a frail and tender and a helpless child, he became totally subservient to his creation. I, I just, I find that an amazing fact. But then he tells us, I want you to be like me. And, you know, when, when God says to me, hey, Dave, I want you to be like me, my impression is, yeah, I want to be like God. You know? But what he's telling us is, I want you to be like me, come serve me. To be subservient to the creation. To, be sub, to, to make ourselves vulnerable to each other. And that's what we were talking about last week in three areas in which we show vulnerability by being submissive. One is to government. Classic example. How many of you love paying taxes? How many of you just say, I wish I could pay my taxes and pay more? Anybody? <laughs> now, you don't have to answer this question, but how many of you don't pay taxes? How many of you wish you didn't? But no. <laughs> but, you know, why do we do this? You know, I, I, this is, it's that time of year, and so I go through this every time of year, and I've got to figure it all out how much I, how much I owe the, the government. My question is, what are you doing for me? <laughs> but, again, it's, it's being subservient. It's humbling ourselves. We find ourselves free when we freely submit then to the rules and the regulations of government. Same thing has to do with employment. Peter talked about employment. We find ourselves free when we've submitted ourselves to our boss, as it were. And, and yeah, I know what some of you think about your boss. You don't know. Others of you, you think you have the greatest boss in the world, and, and, and that's wonderful. Then Peter took it another step, and he talked about the marriage relationship. And I didn't have a whole lot of time to go into that last week. I really raced right through it. Some of you might have thought that that um, uh, I have a very, that when I talk about marriage, but you know, in my conversations, and, I, and I'll say this again, it's not easy being married. It never was intended to be easy being married. But it's well worth the effort. Well worth the effort. And Peter's advice in, in having a good marriage is to both spouses, voluntarily submit yourself to a vulnerable position in giving yourself to one another. I think that's particularly important for men and husbands because uh, we, we, we kind of this idea like, I'm in charge. Well, maybe you are in charge. 
But Jesus says, like Jesus is the head of this church, he says in Ephesians, he gave himself to the church. He died for this church. He totally submit, gave himself in submission to his church, to his bride. To what? To make her glorious and beautiful and wonderful. You'll have a great marriage, gentlemen, if you'll be willing to do that to make your wife the very best that she can be. Is it easy? It's not easy. It's not easy. And over and over again, we get this theme that it's not easy then living this Christian life. Now, this morning, we want to talk about the second necessity. First is we have to have a submissive spirit. The second is there's this matter of suffering. These people are not suffering because they did something stupid or something wrong. We all understand that, don't we? Done some stupid things. And I wouldn't want to begin to catalog some of the stupid things that I've done. And suffered for it. But that's not what he's talking about. He's here talking about those things. To, that he's writing to these, these young believers in Jesus Christ. They find themselves amongst the people where there's this growing contempt towards them, towards their beliefs, towards their God. And over and over, Peter then calls them to be a kind of counterculture. Interesting, I, I, I think, is this. Uh, you know, it's helping to, for me to, to get a different mindset, to look through the eyes of Peter. I mean, think about it for a moment. Here's this guy named Jesus who's come to this world, born as an insignificant child in an insignificant town, uh, he's a carpenter, no big deal. I mean, he's a carpenter, okay? Uh, he's not a lawyer, he's not a teacher, he's not highly educated, he doesn't come from a wealthy background, has no political power, nothing like that. Very insignificant, very insignificant. Grows up until he's about 30 years old, leaves home. Leaves home and gathers a band of men around him, begins to teach these men. Through miracles and signs and wonders and teaching, there's maybe there's several thousand people who have begun to follow him, but 12 that are close. And he stays with these 12 for three years, and after the end of three years, he tells these 12, he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. In other words, what he's saying is he's fully expecting then his followers to carry out his work and to redeem the world. The redemption of the world is through, not by us, not because of our power, but through us. We're, we're to work together, hand in hand with Jesus Christ to redeem this world. And you know what? He actually believes that we can do this. With his, through his power and his strength, he actually believes that we can do this. We don't. So I, I'm reading through Peter. Peter is one of the close ones to Jesus. Peter, by the way, not only one of the close ones, was the one who said, I don't know this Jesus guy. I, he, he's, I don't know him. And he swore and he cursed and he says, I, I'll be, I know this guy. And, 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 and was very adamant about it. And yet here he is. He's writing this book as a spokesman for these people. And, and, and what is he saying to them? He's saying to these people who are under the oppression of the culture that they're in, they're in the minority, definitely, clearly, and in the minority. And what he's saying, you establish a counterculture. By establishing this counterculture, you, this culture then can begin to grow and to develop and actually influence and affect all the people around you. And so that's where he's telling them to, that, that to change their thinking, not just to change their behavior, but change their thinking that their counter behavior to the culture is something that's going to have a profound effect and literally change their culture. Let's, let's look at the verse here. He, he explains this now in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. He says, finally, I look, read these last week very quickly, finally, all of you, have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Peter begins by explaining then, if we're going to have this counterculture, it has to start somewhere. It has to start somewhere. It should start in our home to begin with. Obviously, we talked about that last week. But it also starts within this community. Within this community. If we call ourselves believers, and we call ourselves followers of Jesus Christ, and yet in our in our community here, what we call church, it's no different than being part of the, uh, uh, a club somewhere or being part of some kind of uh, organization. If this is no different than anything else that's out there in the world, then folks, what, what hope do we have of making any difference whatsoever? So Peter is saying to them, these are some characteristics 
that need to be evident with, first of all, within our community of believers, with one another. And, and it's interesting that he doesn't describe them explicitly and in detail because it's an attitude. It's a, it's a heart. It's, a, it's a, something in which we have to work with all the time and, and it can't be something that we do. One, two, three, four, check that off and so we're all, all okay. It, it has to be uh, an integral part of us. He uses uh, in the Greek five words. Five words. Uh, you won't find those five words in the English because the first one is unity of mind. If we want to create this counterculture, it has to be strong to withstand the pressures that come from without. And so he uses these five words, these five adjectives to describe these five characteristics of our behavior within the body of Christ. The first one, unity of mind. Unity of mind. It comes from the Greek word, which is homophone. Homophone. Uh, homo, or single, or one, and phone, which is mine, homophone. And so, he's in, in um, other translations, you find the word harmony. I really rather prefer the word harmony to the word unity of mind. The, the word unity of mind is a very explicit and literal translation of the Greek. But the word harmony is beautiful. The reason the word harmony is beautiful is because... Um, for example, the piano. I don't know how many keys are on a standard piano, but there's a lot of different notes on a standard piano. And when you take those different notes, all of them different, none of them the same, but you can play them together to form a harmony. And uh, the word that's used in some of the scriptures we'll look at, is, it says they were all in one accord. One accord. When we get that chord together, it, it's talking about, it's same, simply saying, we don't have to all be just the same in order to have this harmony. We're not talking about being robotic. We're not talk, talking about being cookie-cutter Christians where bam, 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 bam. Everybody talks the same. Everybody dresses the same. Everybody has the same background, the same culture, even the same theology. Now, I can promise you that none of us have all the same theology and all the same points. And uh, if you want to discuss about it, we'll talk about it on a different day. But uh, uh, I can promise you we're not all the same here. But there are certain things that we have to be in agreement on if we're going to be of the same mind and have unity in that. One of those things has to be that we believe fundamentally, basically, thoroughly, through and through, that Jesus Christ is God. That Jesus Christ is God-man. That he came to this earth and, and he died in our place for our sin, took our punishment. We have to believe that. We have to believe, too, that Jesus rose again from the dead. We have to believe in the resurrection. Otherwise, there's no hope for us. There's no, there's no power. There's no strength. We, there's certain basic doctrines that we have to believe in. And, and again, uh, it's not my intent to go through each of these doctrines because our problem usually isn't that. Our problem isn't what we agree on. Our problem is what we don't agree on. And uh, churches can be split over whether or not there should be an organ or a guitar. Some people prefer a guitar, some people prefer an organ, and they can't worship together because they can't agree on that. Really? It's that fundamental? And, and you know, uh, there's also certain things about whether or not a preacher should wear a tie on Sunday. There are some churches that I go and preach in that I typically will wear a tie simply because that's what they're accustomed to, and I don't want to be offensive. But, you know, there's some people who say, I'm not going to that church. I can't hang out with those people. Their preacher doesn't even wear a tie. Really? These are issues that we need to work on? And, and the harmony issue is something that's so vitally important because you have these people in the midst of this cauldron here. They're, fought, they're, they're being opposed. They're, they're suffering. They need each other. They need to bind together with each other. And so you know what they're doing? They're looking for those things that we can agree on that are going to hold us together, that are fundamental things that we will not back off on. And this is what's going to hold us together and bind us together. We have a statement of faith in our church. It's a statement of faith that we worked through several years ago uh, with a, a group of men who were all very much involved in the church, and we came to the agreement on it. And that, that, that's where we stand. That's where we stand. And if you want to teach in our Sunday school classes and so forth and be involved in any kind of teaching ministry, you need to agree to that statement of faith. It's, it's, what we, it, it's that binding cement to us. 
Is it the same as everybody else? No, it's not the same as everybody else. And so in, in, even in churches getting together, we're not all going to agree. But within the body of Christ, there's got to be this harmony. There can't be this disunity. Otherwise, we will never be a force, a power, that's going to change the community around us. Because all they're going to look at is, and has anybody ever asked you this question? How come there's so many different denominations? Well, I mean, I can tell you the answer, but it's because we're not the same. But for me, I'm not going to fight with different denominations over little detail. We, we're going to look at the big, the big important things, and we're going to stand by those. We believe the Bible to be the Word of God. We believe the Bible to be the inerrant Word of God. We believe that we can trust in the Bible and that, that, that it's going to be our, our standard of faith and practice. We follow that. We don't have any other book. So we might take issues with people who have another book to add to this. We don't have any other book. And, and it goes on like this, but the, the thing is that with this, this harmony, Paul and Peter both said it over and over and over again. Paul says in Romans, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus. See that? Harmony in accord. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verses uh, 1, uh, 1 Corinthians 1.10. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Um, again, you probably won't be surprised when I say this. I think athletics is a great illustration. Uh, I watched a basketball game a couple of weeks ago, and um, the one team has a lot of talent. The other team was not very talented. The untalented team actually won the game. You know why? They were disciplined. They were focused. They worked in harmony. No hot shots. This other team had a hot shot. There was him and sometimes four others. The other team had five guys working together. They knew what, you, what each other were doing. They had different roles, different positions, different sizes, different abilities, but they worked in great harmony to get the job done. That's how it is, folks. We work together as a team. So I think all kids ought to be involved in athletics of some sort because it, it just helps us to realize where, where our talents are and, okay, I don't play the bass guitar like, Glenn, but like Ken does. He'll be glad for that. But, that's, but we can still work together. I can't sing very well, but I can certainly sing loud when everybody else is singing. So our, we, this is why the, the issue of harmony is so important if we're going to be a counterculture to the pagan culture that's around us. The second word that he talks about there is sympathy. And the word in the Greek is sympathes, sympathes. It's only used here in the New Testament. This word sympathy is actually, uh, for us as English speakers, I think could be better used, the, be the word that better describes it is uh, compassion or compassion. Because when we think of sympathy, sympathy, we usually think of, oh, I feel sorry for you. I have sympathy for you. But it's, it's much more than that. This word sympathy then has to do with the fact that of caring deeply about the needs, the joys, the sorrows of others in our community. Typically, we only, we only equate sympathy with sorrow. But this also has to do with, with this whole idea of, of enjoying somebody else's success. I think one of the most difficult things we deal with is that uh, when somebody else is successful, it's like, come it was you and not me you know and, and sometimes it's difficult for us and somebody goes in yes I got a raise and uh, or uh, anyway, you, you know what I'm talking about and it's it's hard to deal so and, and again it using the team situation with somebody else is just really good and they're they're sitting out there for basketball players are sitting on their their pot those three pointers and pot those three pointers and nothing's going in for you the best thing to do is keep giving the guy the ball. But you're thinking, no, man, my turn. <laughs> Open is coming, for, coming back for me. So that, that, 
that uh, word sympathy there has to do with after the game, going to them and say, you rock. You were good, man. I'm with you. That was fantastic. But inside you're going, yes, that was me. So when Paul's talking about this word, he's not just simply saying feel sorry. He's saying enter into other people's joy also. Rejoice with them. When they succeed, man, you're right there and say, good for you. Good for you. In other words, and the verses that uh, he talks about, that Paul mentions this. He says, rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. And then he talks about the, the word phil, uh, brotherly love. Uh, Philadelphus. Philadelphus. I, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I did study how to pronounce these words. Philadelphus. The family love for one another. For Peter, it's vitally, vitally important. Because he mentioned it earlier in chapter 1, verse 22. Somebody put it like this. He said, in its repetition here suggests that this practical harmony within the body of Christ will not occur without a concerted effort by individual believers to approach the relationships within the body of Christ with a sense of familial love. Have you notice that sometimes we refer to each other or one another as uh, brother, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so? Have you been to a church where they call fellow believers brothers and sisters? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, in Chinese, they often refer to somebody as xiong di or di xiong, wan di xiong or chan di xiong. And they'll refer to them as jie mei. Jie mei is the, the, the sister. Uh, a lot of my background has been, I, typically when I go someplace, I'll be in churches, they'll address me as Brother Homer. Brother Homer. Or Brother Dave. Why? Because there's this sense of family. There's a sense of belonging. It's so vitally important in our, in our midst. It's, 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 uh, it develops that camaraderie. The thing is, I know <laughs> about families is that brothers don't always like each other. But they're still brothers. And sometimes uh, sisters, they want to scratch each other's eyeballs out. But they're still sisters. And uh, in our family, it was uh, brother-sister rivalry. <laughs> My son Gabriel, when, when, remember when, Nic when Nicole was born, he couldn't walk by Nicole without smacking her on the head. You know, he just <laughs> but now they're best of friends. You know, they went to school together. They just, they're just great. But that's kind of how it is in a family. And sometimes in a family, we don't get along with each other, but we're going to recognize, hey, we're a family. And when, the, when push comes to shove, we're going to come together. We're going to make it work because we're a family. And when somebody's hurting in the, in the family, uh, when, when <laughs> and I don't know about your family, but if, if somebody's hurt in our family, man, everybody just rallies to them. And for us, that's a ton of people when we all get together. Uh, Gabriel had his wedding, and uh, we, just, we just, how do I say, we just descended on the place, the whole family, and filled up this whole house because it was, uh, it was a brother getting married. All the grandkids and everybody come. So that's the way. It, but then it's also the time of sorrow, too, in the time of sorrow. The sad thing, when my, when my grandmother died on my mother's side, my mother couldn't come. And for my family, I was the only one who was able to attend, of, attend my grandmother's funeral. It was very sad to me. She was a, um, a great woman, very simple, lived by herself much of her life. Her husband passed on earlier in her life. And, and, uh, uh, but to me... Because, because I, I lived with her for about a year while I was going through this rebellious stage. And she just, she was the sweetest. I mean, she didn't, uh, she didn't agree with the dumb stuff I was doing. And I'll tell you, she made me feel so horrible when I wasn't doing what was right. And never said a word. She was just so kind. And I was sad that we couldn't be there for her funeral. But see, that's what, that's what family's about. Family's also being about to... Uh, a, being able to correct someone and say, hey, you know what, brother, that's not the direction you should go. I don't, I don't think that's going to help you. Family's also saying, hey, you got an opportunity there. Let me help you. Let me help you be successful at that. And, and Peter's saying, if we're going to be this counterculture, this is what's got to be a part of us. This is the way we have to see living together. We can't just see ourselves as us and them getting together on Sunday. 
we're a family here. And no matter how big churches are, this is one of the characteristics it has to be. It's our evidence of genuine Christian faith. Romans 12.10 says, Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9 says, Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. The next word that uh, Peter uses in describing our, these characteristics is a tender heart. A tender heart. Eusplichnos. Eusplichnos. Uh, there's an interesting word there. Um, even a bit crude, I would imagine. Because the word you, then, is a word that means well or healthy. The splanknos has to do with entrails or your digestive system. The word literally means a healthy digestive tract, healthy intestines. So, to have a tender heart, is to one is one that has healthy intestines. If you have the old King James Bible, the old King James Bible uses the word bowels. It's a literal translation of this word, that you should have healthy bowels. So, um, really for us, it, uh, in, in um, uh, uh, well, I don't know if I need to describe it any further, because here's what it is. This tender heart, and we don't get it in this English translation here, but in fact is we might get it better if we use the word bowels because it's, it's a call to action. And you understand that uh, when you have healthy bowels, there's a call to action. Sometimes you have to respond and do what you have to do. And sometimes we're called to action. Not because it happens to fit into our schedule, but because that's what we need to do. And that's what he's talking about with this word, this, this tender-heartedness. To be tender-hearted, to, be, to, to have this, uh, this compassion. In, the, in this culture in which Peter is talking, bowels were considered the seat or the center of emotions and affections. It's the equivalent to our use of the word heart. So, we as believers are to be full of compassion, tender-hearted to those who are experiencing pain and suffering. It doesn't mean it's more than saying, oh, gee, that's, that's too bad. I'm really sorry for it. No, it means going and standing alongside of them and saying, what can I do? Well, how can I help? Where can I join in? What, what, what part can I be a part of? And, and you say, well, it's not convenient for them. No, sometimes these things are not convenient. But we, it's a motivation to move and to act. The verse he says to us, is put on then as God's chosen one, holy, beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. First John chapter 3, verse 17, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? He's saying, again, we need to be that example. That needs to be our culture in a culture that doesn't care. Lastly, he talks about this word, a humble mind. Tapenophron. Tapenophron. Or tapenophron. That's what it is. Tapenophron. Humility means that others are considered more important than ourselves. It's an awareness of areas of weakness and need and desire to grow in these areas and the willingness to receive assistance with these needs. In other words, folks, it's simply saying this. Sometimes we look at humility as being, oh, I am no good. Oh, you're right. Look, get over it. But, you know, some people, they, they don't step up to do what needs to be done because they have this false sense of humility, like, oh, man, I'm just not good enough. Where inside they're saying, yeah, if you just ask me, I'd do it. And, and I'm of the opinion that, if, you know, if you're good at doing something, step up and do it. There's, there's a, a false humility that can be very destructive in thinking that we're, we, we are not good enough to do something when God has empowered us and given us the ability to, to do certain, to, to perform well at certain gifts. It's, this humility is understanding, you know, there's something here that, that um, I really should be doing, but I'm not very good at this. So you go to somebody and say, will you please teach me how? Will you please teach me? You're, you seem to be able to do this, and so teach me how. Being humble is having a teachable spirit. Understanding that I, I just, 
I, I need help in this matter. Please help me. And for men, one of the hardest things for men to say to their wife is, can you show me how to do this? The other hardest thing to say is, I was wrong. That's part of having the humble spirit. Being able to say these things and to be able to, to admit we're not all the best that we think that we are. Philippians chapter 3, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Humility is the attitude that's saying, I'm going to serve. I don't need to be in the limelight, but I'm going to serve so I can help others. Um, and then Peter goes on in, in these two verses that we read. He talks about um, how this is our community. Our community's teamwork is, is exhibited in harmony and brotherly love, and our team spirit is exhibited in sympathy, compassion, and humility. So I say to you, Grace Church, how does our team look? How does our team look? Do we work together in harmony? Do we have the, the, the spirit in, a, in our team of one where we're going to uh, be sympathetic and compassionate, work in humility with one another? I, this, this thing we call church, it doesn't happen on Sunday morning. This can hardly, what we're doing right now, this can hardly be called church. I know we say we're going to church and all that. But we don't, that's not what it is. If we're going to have an impact in our community, and if our, if our culture that we develop here is going to be such that it's going to have an impact on our culture around us, to be the counterculture, then these are things that have to be a part of our life. They're, they're, they're part of our, our teamwork and are part of our team spirit that helps us to be that influence around the world. Now, ah. Uh, the rest of the passage has to do with saying that it's not easy. Peter's theme, it's not easy. It's good, but it's not. Let's read then from uh, uh, 1 Peter, and beginning with uh, chapter 3 and verse 10. We'll go through, I think it's the 22 or 17, I'm not sure. But anyway, 1 Peter, For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Verse 17, it's better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. My dad would say, <clears throat> You know, if I come home, I'd say, I'd say to my dad, well, dad, it's better late than never. And his reply would be, better never late. So, Peter says, it's better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. My reply is, it's better not to suffer. I mean... Who of us is saying, boy, I can hardly wait, man. I, I need to get out there and just uh, get to suffer and have people pound on me and mock me and, and criticize me. Who, who wants that? Who wants that? But we're looking in the wrong direction, looking in the wrong direction. What we need to be doing is looking in towards Jesus, looking towards Jesus. Too often when, when uh, difficult times come, we, we focus our attention on the difficulty instead of lifting up our eyes and seeing, Oh, yeah, God's in this. God's got a purpose in this. There's a reason it for it. And again, if I were to use athletics, which is nothing new to you, uh, is that sometimes when we're out there preparing for a game or practicing or learning a skill or even playing, with the, playing the piano and it gets tedious and over and over again, or 
are trying to learn how to play the guitar. Or at one time, I wanted to learn how to play the harmonica. The mouth is getting all sore, and it's very painful. And probably one of the reasons why I never succeeded is because I never broke through that. But you see, if we look beyond the, 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 the pain and the suffering that we're going through, whatever it is we're trying to do, we can see then where, where the result is, where we're going, where God wants us to go. So don't get ourselves caught up in this in the suffering that we're going through at this particular time, whatever that might be. Don't just look at the criticism. Don't look at the, the, the bad vibes and the opposition that's, that we're facing right now. Lift up our eyes and look beyond it. It's a part of our, it's a part of our journey. Uh, there's a couple of things I'd like for us to point out here, uh, I'd like for us to see. Uh, Peter says to us, if we suffer for our faith, we are blessed. Really? So why don't we want to suffer more often so we get more blessing, right? Huh? Maybe it's not going to come here and now. We like, uh, we're, this is the McDonald's generation. It's, you know, instant. We got to have it now. We want instant gratification. That's why we have plastic cards. So if you want it, you can get it. You know, I mean, whatever that little gadget is, the new thing is, it's, uh, it's, it's so much a part of us. And so when we, th- when we say, okay, if I suffer, I'm going to be blessed, we want it here, now. And we have to realize it's not, it doesn't necessarily happen that way. Again, it's lifting up our eyes and looking beyond now, looking where, where we're going to be going, where he's taking us, what our journey is. It's understanding we're passing through this place. We're going to our, our destination. Blessing and suffering are very much related. Why are blessing and suffering related? Because of Jesus. Jesus. Jesus' suffering brought us blessing. Jesus, after having suffered, went to be with his Father in heaven. He sits on the right hand on our behalf. Blessing is something where um, Jesus talked about in teaching his disciples. Uh, Let me just read this for you um, real quick here. Have any of you heard of the Beatitudes? Read the Beatitudes lately? Something we probably ought to read most, uh, most every day. Um, I don't have it up on the screen for you. I just want to read it. Uh. Here's, here's, this is interesting. Blessed, this is Jesus speaking. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who mourn, for you shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. Come on, parents. That's what you're teaching your kids to be, meek. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Here's a good one. Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now listen to what he says. Blessed are, this is Jesus, these are Jesus' words, Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you, and so they persecuted Jesus. So this this thing of uh, suffering and blessing, it's not something that we should shy away from. I don't think it's something that we need to be running towards and saying, hey, I've got to have this. But it's saying it's something that we're not going to say, hey, I'm going to compromise my beliefs because I don't want to suffer. No, instead, we're going to live godly, righteous lives. If we live a good life, if we live a godly life, there's always the possibility of those who don't like Christians or Christian ideas of what living a good life is. There's always the possibility then that the boss might ask you to tweak the numbers a little bit, to fudge on the numbers. There's always the possibility that you may be tempted not to pay all the taxes that you owe to the government. 
And there's that little voice saying, well, you know, you can get away with it. It's no big deal. It's just a few dollars. There's always these temptations and these possibilities. But Jesus is saying that the good life, then, is following him, entrusting ourselves to him, and letting him carry the weight for us. When we've been deeply wounded and we choose to forgive, that's hard to do. It's hard to do, especially when the person who's wounded us still has this anger and this angst and, and, and we thought that we were friends with him. We wanted to get along with him. And it doesn't happen. You know, I really, uh, honestly, I, I really admire you folks who work in an environment that is not Christian. Not Christian. For me, it's, it's, I, I've talked to somebody the other day. I said, maybe I should quit being a pastor. Maybe I should just go get a real job so I can hang out with people who aren't, aren't Christian. Because as soon as pastor comes around, everybody's got me locked in. You know, It's like uh, I can't even go out to coffee with somebody with, because they think I'm pastor. I'm trying to get them in or something. You know? So uh, I didn't. You know, anyway, you know, I, I just want to say I really admire you. I admire where you're at. I admire the fact that you go on Mondays to your job and you want to do a job that's going to be pleasing to God and you want to be Jesus to people around you who oftentimes don't care at all whatsoever. And you're on the front lines. You're right out where Peter's talking about. He, he's, he, and you're facing decisions every day about is this the right thing to do? What would Jesus do? You are out there, you're playing the role of Jesus in a society that crucified him, that hates him. And this is exactly what Peter's trying to do. He's, he's trying to encourage us and say, you know, there's a good reason, there's a blessing for this. There comes a point when living an extremely good life, it just rubs up against the values of this world. And so there's two things. I want to close with these two things that Peter tells us. He says, first of all, don't fight back, but bless. Verse 11, don't fight back, but bless. To bless someone was to invoke God's favor upon them. Not enough just to say, well, I wish you well, but it's to seek their peace, their well-being, their flourishing, even though they don't like what you do. Then the second thing he says to us in verses 14 and 15, don't be captive by the fear of people. Set up Christ as Lord. Trust him and trust him alone. If we're going to be this community that's going to change our culture around us, then we're going to have to learn to bless when others curse us. We're going to have to learn also to be the... To not If we'll do that, we can have a powerful influence by first being a...